Hello everybody, uh, I'm Frankie. I'm Becky. We are Cornerstone Gems and we are happy to be here with you guys tonight. We are going to do our Bible study. Um, it's not going to be a very long one, however, I think it's a really good one. Uh, I think during this, this time, God has really been speaking to his people. And I pray that you get something out of this because Becky and I had been talking about this over the weekend about um, being somewhere desperate for God. I think that a lot of us have forgotten that desperation or maybe we just haven't felt that desperation until this happened. And so during this hard time that we've had with shelter in place and being quarantined and not really being able to be together, I think that we've had to really press into God. I know that I have and so I can't speak for anybody else, but I sure have had some alone time, a lot of alone time with God. And I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing you all, but in the meantime, we're going to be talking to you tonight about being desperate for God. So, um, you know that in, we were created to have an intimate relationship with God. Jesus came to make that possible. Sometimes I find that I get really distracted. I think that our circumstances, that our lives can get in the way of, um, I, and we've talked about this in women's ministry many, many times. What are you focusing on? And so I think things get in our way. We put things in front of God. I think God has shown me, especially during this quiet time, that there's several things that I have done that. It, uh, it could be your family. It could be your job. Uh, it could be money. It could be shopping. It could be eating. <laughs> it could be a lot of things, y'all. And, um, and there's times when I'm so desperate for God's presence, um, for his mercy and his grace. And we find ourselves in a place of desper desperation that really nothing that we do can satisfy that but God. So I'm wondering if you've been there lately. And um, so Becky and I were talking, and a lot of things started coming to both of us uh, as we were talking about being desperate for God. And so um, we thought, well, who in the Bible? Let's think, let's think about there's so many that were desperate for God. I mean, we know King David in the Psalms. Oh my goodness, over and over you see the desperation in the Psalms, and I love the Psalms. I, I, I study them quite a bit, but I love the story of Esther. I think about the story that, or what she went through, um, her and her cousin, you know, Mordecai, and um, so I'm going to read a little bit, and then we're going to talk a little bit, then we'll, we'll go to Becky for a minute. Esther lived in ancient Persia a hundred years after the Babylonian captivity. When Esther's parents died, the orphan child was adopted and raised by her older cousin cousin Mordecai. One day the king of Persia, okay I'm going to butcher his name, As Asareas, that's close enough, threw a lavish party. On the final day of the festivities he called his queen Vashti, eager to flaunt her beauty to his guests, but the queen actually refused to come before him and he was filled with anger so he disposed of that queen and forever removed, him, removed her from his presence. To find his new, new queen, he hosted a royal beauty pageant, and Esther was chosen for the throne. Her cousin Mordecai became a minor official in the Persian government of Susa. Soon Mordecai un uncovered a plot to assassinate the king. He told Esther about the conspiracy, and she reported it to her king, giving credit to Mordecai. That plot was thwarted, and Mordecai's act of kindness was preserved in the Chronicles of the King. At this time, the king's highest official was a wicked man named Haman. He hated the Jews, especially Mordecai, who had refused to bow down to him. Haman devised a scheme to have every Jew in Persia killed. The king agreed to the plan to annihilate, to annihilate the, the Jewish people on a specific day. Meanwhile, Mordecai learned of the plot and shared it with Esther, challenging her with these famous words. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you are alone of all the Jews will escape, that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise in another place, in another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that, but, I'm sorry y'all, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. That's in Esther 4, 13 and 14. Esther urged all the Jews to fast and pray for deliverance. Then risking her own life, brave young Esther approached the king with a request. She invited the king and Haman to a banquet where eventually she revealed her Jewish heritage to the king, as well as Haman, Haman, excuse me, diabolical plot, plot to have her and her people killed. In a rage, the king ordered Haman, Haman to be hung on the gallows, the very same gallows he had built for Mordecai. So Mordecai was promoted to Haman's 
in Haman's, yeah, to his position, and the Jews were granted protection throughout the land. The people celebrated God's tremendous deliverance, and the joyful festival of Purim, Purim was instituted. So what I got out of this story, though, is that a young, beautiful queen, because it does say that she was, I mean, she won a beauty pageant. Um, she hid her, her heritage, obviously, because she would have been killed, or that's what her thinking was. But I, I, when I, I think about her going to her room, because she told her people to fast and pray. And I think about the desperation that she had to have felt, that desperation for God to do something, to move. And, of course, God did move. He moved mightily. You know, she sought God with, faith, with prayer and fasting. And I wonder, you know, just how desperate she was. And I think about what God he did. He revealed the truth for her in the presence of not just her husband, the king, but in, in front of her enemy. Well, that's what I was thinking about that story. Back in that day, you did not go to the king unless you were summoned. Mm -hmm. Her life was at risk just by going into the king absolutely alone because if he did not find favor on her yeah then she would have been killed also so she had she was in that spot but she found favor with the king mm -hmm. and that's i think where we are when we go before god you know we find favor we're able to go to to him because of Jesus, we have that favor, mm -hmm. and we don't have to go through anybody else. That's a good point. Absolutely. I think about, you know, um, when was the last time any of us were so desperate? Because <clears throat> if anything, this this time, I think in our lives, this, this virus, this coronavirus, has taught people. Because um, I've heard the, the expression that, it, you know, the church needs to stand up and, and fight not just the church, I think all Americans, and I think the best, you know, as a warrior, we are called warriors. I think about the Gideon. I've been studying Gideon. I don't know if that's a great study. I love that study. I think about Gideon um, when the angel of the Lord appeared to him and called him mighty warrior, and I, I wrote a, a little thing about that, and I think about his expression, you know, like, <laughs> me, you know, because he was actually hiding at that time, uh, and so I think about standing is fighting, Standing up and doing what's right is fighting. That is what we are called to do as a church. So I love that um, this has brought this to my this just to my heart about being desperate for God because there has been so many times that I have fell on my face in prayer, desperate for God. So I love that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, a scripture that come that uh, the Lord gave me for this um, goes along with everything that's going on right now for me. I know. Um, it's in Isaiah, it's verse 43, chapter 43, verse 2, and it says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, and neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Um, it seems like during this time, there has been so much going on. Um, we've not only had the virus and been separated for, from our church family but we've also been separated from our families mm -hmm. and not to mention all the bad weather we're having it just seems like there's stuff piling on one after the other after the other but I know in my life and in yours just through different situations through all this God has shown himself mm -hmm. that no matter what he's going to take care of you and uh, you know the storm the last storm we had on Sunday it was awful the winds and everything and I could just hear stuff outside my house and I mean I prayed and prayed and prayed and the storm went around us there was not a tree down mm. around us there was no branches down I mean God just protected everything around us and that's just you know how good God is because you know he took care of us in the storm that is another place that he takes care of us you know he controls the winds and the waves so um, we don't, we shouldn't be afraid to ask God to calm those winds for us, to mm -hmm. calm that storm for us, because as His child, He choose, He He protects us. That's mm -hmm. through water, fire, wind. Mm -hmm. You know, He protects us from it all. So, okay. and uh, I believe in the desperate, the desperate part. I've I've learned that through all of this uh, since I've quit work. 
and staying at home, you know, I was, I was able to go out and socialize. Now I've been at home with this stay at home order. I was at home all the time. I never got out very much, just go to the store or whatever. And I never realized how much things consumed my life. Mm. And once all that was taken and stripped away, I realized I'm alone. But then God was showing me through all this, no, you're not alone. I'm here. And I've got to be, I've gotten to be closer to him and get that relationship back closer to where I was before because all the distractions I had, they weren't bad distractions. They were life. It was just life. It was the busyness of doing things at church, the busyness of taking care of business or mm -hmm. your house. That's right. And in staying busy, I believe the, the devil uses that a lot. Nothing bad. You're not doing anything bad, but he uses it to keep you busy enough to where it's like, oh, I don't have time to read today. I'll, I'll just read this one little verse and then I'll go on. Mm -hmm. But all God wants is he wants you to sit down with him. He wants you to talk to him. That's Adam. That's where mm -hmm. we were talking about mm -hmm. Adam. God created each one of us to have a personal relationship with him. That's why we were created. He wants to walk and talk with us, just like he walked and talked with Adam. But the, we are now, because of Jesus, he's the second Adam, because of what he did on the cross and he ripped that veil, mm -hmm. we're now able to go in boldly into the throne. You know, nobody in the Old Testament was allowed to do that. No, they weren't. But we are. And that's, uh, that's how much God desires that special relationship with us. Yes, definitely. <clears throat> I think one of the, there's so many stories in the Bible that I, I love. I, I could just, I, I, I read them over and over. Um, one of my favorites, too, is the woman with the issue of the blood. I've done a lesson on that in women's ministry. <clears throat> and I think about, um, in Luke, it starts in Luke 8, 43 and 48. I'm going to read it out of my Bible, if I can see it. Okay. Okay, so, Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touch me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason that she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be good of be good be of good cheer. Your faith has made you go has well has made you well. Go in peace, excuse me. I think about that story. I know that we I think Mary's even done a lesson on that before, and I remember hearing it from a different perspective, you know, and because she was an outcast, she was unclean, considered unclean, and the faith that she had, though, she didn't even know him. She didn't know Jesus. She heard about him and about how he healed the sick and how he was casting out demons, and she was determined, but I think about her desperation just to touch his garment. And I think, and we have so much more than that, really. We have so much more than that. But all she wanted was just to touch his garment. And she pressed on and she pressed through, no matter the consequences to her. Because, like I said, she was unclean and she was... She had reached she, that moment of despair. Absolutely, because it says, she tried everything. Exactly. It says first she, she yeah. went and tried it man's way. She mm -hmm. tried to do everything. Yeah. Which... I'm guilty of a lot of times. I'll try to pro solve a problem myself. Mm -hmm. And she tried to solve it herself. Yeah. But when she realized that she could not do it on her own, and she heard of Jesus, then she got desperate. Yeah. And then she was reaching. Oh, yeah. But I think about her. I mean, I've been, I'm a visual person. I love visual. That's I love visualization because I, it, it just brings it to life. I mean, I like stuff. And the Bible is a living thing. So I think about her reaching out and then Jesus knowing, you know, he knew that his power went out. I love that. I love that. And then, you know, just 
daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. That's, I mean, your faith has healed you. Your mm -hmm. faith has healed you. And I think, how many of us can say that we have that kind of faith? Um, like you said, when things are stripped away and it's just you and God, that's what he wants is that intimate relationship. That's what we were created for. And I think that we let, I have let so many other things come between me and God. Not intentionally. It's just life. It's the busyness is uh, in order to distract us. And it really is where you stare is where you steer. So where you're staring at, I don't care if you've got three jobs. You have time to go and you have time to go shopping or you have time to do this. Don't tell me you don't have time to spend with God. I don't believe it anymore. I'm, I'm like, you, we make time for what we want. That's just being honest. That's as being honest as I can be. Mm -hmm. But I think about the crowd and how they, you know, they're standing around pushing in and Peter saying, you know, all these people in here worried about, you know, who touched her garment. And so, and she knew she had been had. So she came and confessed. And I wonder about that crowd, what they saw. You know, what were they thinking? Because this is someone who they've ostracized. Like, they're like, well, she's, she's nasty, she's unclean because of this, you know, whatever. But I think about that. I think about, there's somebody in those, there's no telling what that crowd thought. However, watching her, she had reached the point that she didn't care anymore. Exactly. She didn't care yeah. what, what people thought, what, peop what people were saying about her. She didn't care about the circumstances going on around her. All she cared about was touching him, and getting I, to him. Yeah, and, and but you know what I think is somebody in that crowd was probably completely changed that day. There's no telling how many people, honestly, because um, that's just like when any you're in a church service and you hear the message and it gets to somebody, it may not get to this person, but somebody hears something that changes their life. You know, God changes people's lives. And I believe that that day was a turning point for that crowd too, not just that woman, but that crowd. Mm -hmm. So and the disciples, because they, you know, they. Although I know, I know that they they failed him many times, and they seen him do miraculous things, and they did miraculous things through him. So, anyway, um, okay. So, I think it took such determination and, and desperation on her part to press through and just simply touch Jesus. And he wanted the woman and the crowd. That's it. He wanted them to know that his garments had not caused her to be healed, but the strength of her faith. Mm -hmm. And so I think about, Lord, do I have that kind of faith? You know, do I really? I think that this has tested a lot of people's faith. I think that it's tested a lot of people's um, prayer lives. They're, they're not just that, but I think it's made us question, Lord, I mean, if I'm going to be honest and be real, and I told somebody on the phone, we were talking, because she was like, she was badgering me is what she was doing. <laughs> she goes, I know you're not okay. Yes, I am okay. And she goes, you can't be, because you're, you know, you're being at home all this time with, without your kids and your grandkids. I said, let me tell you something. I am better than okay. I said, I love my children, but I realized that I put my family in front of God so many times over and over. And I'm being real transparent right now, but... I will say that God has shown me something during this time, and when you do, when he does, you know, when you do come back together, it's sweeter because now I can see things a little bit more clearly, like the veil, you know, has been torn, the blinders are kind of off of my eyes. So I will say that during this time that God has moved mightily in my family. So. That's awesome. That is good. You got anything else good over there? Um, well, uh one of the other people that we were going to talk about was Ruth. Mm -hmm. And I love the story of Ruth. To me, it represents Jesus taking care of his church. And the reason I see that is Boaz, you know, God is just, God does just like Boaz. Ruth was content just to get that little bit of what was there. Mm -hmm. But Jesus does the same for us that Boaz he ordered them give them give her more don't tell her but give her more and that's what Jesus does to us it's like there's been several instances where I'll be like God I, I, I just want this I just want this but instead of this God gives me this yeah. and I, I just amazed at how God takes care of his children he goes above and beyond mm -hmm. Um, he gives us things that we don't ask for that are far better than what we would think was Absolutely. the best for our lives. Absolutely. Um, I just, 
he, he provides in so many ways and I thank the Lord that you know he, he takes care of us in, in that way not only providing like food wise like he did for them but he also does that with us spiritually and he also does that with us um, physically because I know you mm. know I'm like Lord I want like with my shoulder I want to be healed but I thought I'm going to have to have surgery to have this done but no God completely healed me without surgery. Mm-hmm. So it was far better than what God, what I asked God for. I was like, God, heal me through this surgery. But God didn't. He healed me on his own without the surgery. And that, to me, is far better, a greater blessing than having to go through that surgery well, for that, what I asked for, for what I thought was yeah. the avenue that I was going to have to go. And also, it shows people around you, you know, that... That God is still a healer, mm-hmm. and there's there's many that's waiting on a healing from God, and um, I mean I still believe in His healing. I still believe it. Um, do I believe that He does it through many different ways? Of course He does. He does mm-hmm. it however He sees Absolutely. fit. That it's the best way that's gonna that that will be the best for us in the long run. And you know, um, I was reminded today that Psalms 91 has been my go-to. I think it has been for a lot of people because I've seen a lot of it on social media. And if you haven't read it, <clears throat> I read it over and over and over. But the reason that I do, it brings me comfort. Mm-hmm. I think that anything that can bring you comfort it, in this book, it's a, it's a, it's a done deal. And <clears throat> it brings me comfort. And I want to read it because I think it, it goes along with that being that desperate. If you're desperate and you're scared or you're afraid, because we've had many people, I've talked to many people about being afraid. And even... People that I really was really surprised by um, that had fear. You know, I know I'm not supposed to fear. I said, yeah, but we are human. But you've got you got to be every day. I think just like Ruth, this is what I told you too. Ruth was, um, Boaz provided every day. He, he made sure they left her something every day. Mm-hmm. Just like the Israelites. Every day God provided. Every day. Mm-hmm. What I have found is that if you are intentional, if you have fear or worry or stress or anxious, and the Bible says don't be anxious for anything and everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving in our heart. It's kind of hard to have that thanksgiving at times when you are uh, anxious or you're stressed or you're worried. So I have found for me is that when I get up in the morning, I'm very intentional about God. I know that today I'm going to need you <laughs> to, yes. to walk me through this. You know, Tommy leaving and not knowing what was going to happen. Um, being away from the kids. So it was just so many things, bam, bam, bam. And you know, I'm not saying that it, I was the only one going through anything because that's not what I mean. But what I'm saying is, is every day I had to get up and ask God to, to sustain me, to walk me through it and to be my strength. And he did every single day. And to the point to where I had such peace, I cannot even explain it. Um, Cause y'all know God's peace, so I don't have to explain it. But to know that at the end of the night that God was taking care of me is a huge thing for for anybody i think so <clears throat> well i'm gonna know that i'm learning through all this even through reading ruth that god is my protector i'm learning that a lot especially with the way michael's working all this time and mm-hmm. you know he's always gone during the storms and stuff like that so uh i spent a lot of time by myself and i've been i have a devotional guide that i've been using and it takes me through different parts of the bible and i was reading in Exodus about the children of Israel. And I thought, man, I've read this story, I know. Mm-hmm. But I read it and something just jumped out at me that I'm like, man, I know this has been there, but I, ne- I don't know why I've never noticed it. When the Israelites came up to the sea, the pillar of cloud was in front of them and the Pharaoh's army was behind them. But the Bible says that pillar of cloud left the front mm-hmm. and went behind them to separate them from Pharaoh's army. And I thought, I have never, I've read that story a thousand times, but I've never caught that. Mm-hmm. You know? That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. He protects our front and our back, that. and he watches over. Watches I love over. that. I love that. So <clears throat> Psalms 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers. 
and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler, and you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. I love that. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, that has been a go-to for me. Um, I mean, you can go on and on in, in Psalms. I think that I think if that doesn't bring you comfort, um, that not much <laughs> will. So, yes. you know, when it comes to the Christian life, I think desperation is essential to growing and deepening our faith. I believe that. If you haven't felt desperation in any of this time, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Because I sure have. Um, I think it is a positive condition. I think those um, who have just begun a relationship with God may have this insatiable desire for more understanding and experience of, of God in his life. I think that's new Christians. I think they, you know, they have that hunger. I think we have forgotten what that hunger feels like. I think that, I mean, when we're here at church, it's all good. You know, the Spirit's all, oh, God's the Spirit. The Lord shows up for us, I don't know, all the time. And I love that that um, we love to praise together. I love that. But when you step out of this building, it becomes, that's really where it becomes real. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we have less and less experiences. I think we have less and less encounters. Um, so I think we get hardened. Let me put it that way. I think we get numbed by life a lot of times. I think that um, we don't press in. Like that woman with issue of blood. I don't think we reach for that hymn. Desperation will cause that. And I have found that to be so very true in my own life. Because I have felt such desperation. Um, I think we can get very comfortable in our faith. I think we can get very cozy with it. Instead of being on fire. I believe that um, we become lukewarm. And I don't mean um, that we're not... Christian, that's not what I mean. I think we, our faith becomes that way. You know, somebody gave me a mustard seed, and I look at it every day, and I think, you know, I love that it, that um, in the Bible, you know, faith, if you have faith, everybody has faith the size of a mustard seed. Everybody has faith the size of a mustard seed and can move a mountain. You say that mountain move, and it moves, and I'm thinking, how does that really work, and how do we apply that to our life? Is that... The only way that you can apply that to your life is to get to know the character and who God is. Because that's where our faith is from. Mm -hmm. And through situations where we have to desperately seek Him. And so I think this situation, we've had to desperately seek Him in all things. I mean, I think about our staff here at church. I think about our deacons. This is, there's no way this has been easy for them. Because yes. um, there's no guidelines here. There's nothing written in stone. That says, okay, we can't have church because of this and this is virus. This is, I mean, this is unprecedented. I know that. For uh, I've talked to so many people, and, and being in, in my job too, I've talked to a lot of people. So I, I've got to witness more because I can't see people. So I've had more conversations on the phone with people than they would just come in and pay a payment and leave. So I've got to talk to many people on the phone. I think God has really made ways for us in this time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when we all come back together, the testimonies are just going to be, they're going to be mind-blowing. And um, so I think that we have to remain desperate, though, um, for his companionship. I think we have to get to know him in person. Uh, I think there's always so much more to discover about God, just like mm -hmm. what you just said. You did not realize that. You've read that a hundred times. I think there's always more to understand in his dealings and the world around us. I believe that he is really showing the world something right now um, mm -hmm. through all this mess. So um, I don't know um, what else that we can do as far as pressing in. I feel like that he needs to be everything first. Mm -hmm. I think that's where he stripped away a lot of people's families or, you know, where you can't have contact. I think that it has shown us that God needs to come first. And when he comes first, he's going to take care of the rest. So, I think we should first seek. You know, we should first seek the, the the giver before the gifts. I love mm -hmm. that the giver before the. In Psalms 42, we see the psalmist's heart longing after God. He sings, "As the heart pants after the water brook, so pants my soul after you. O oh God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God?" I love that scripture. Mm -hmm. In Psalm 63 and 1, David sings, 
You, God, are my God, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you, in a dry and parched land where there is no water. That's desperation. You know, I, I, you can just keep reading and reading, and it's like, that's desperation. But the love that he had for God, I think, how many of us can really pour our heart out like that? Yeah. I, I think that I think we're coming to that, you know, that that place of I hope revival like you've never seen before. I believe that God's going to move mightily. I do. I believe that when this is all said and done, that things are going to be different. They have to be different. Mm -hmm. We cannot go back to the same old, same old. Mm -hmm. no, I don't think we will. I don't think we will at all. I hope not. I I know that I'm changed from this. I know that I've talked to many many people that are, and I think that we've taken so much for granted. Oh my goodness. Well, that's the one thing you realize is realize how much I've taken the church for, for granted. Absolutely. Taken our services for granted. You know, I mean, we all need to have that personal relationship, but also the gathering together of the Don't church, yeah. it's edifying. It lifts you up. When the spirit moves in the services, you feel refreshed. Not that you can't feel that at home, but there's something about being together with other it's about believers. the believers, yeah. It's about and being together. Coming mm -hmm. together. I believe that too. I believe that it is refreshing. and um, But I also think that people can, even for the work of God, can get exhausted because they're doing so much for, you know, they say it's for God. But really I think we get in such a habit and we get in a routine that... The love that we had, when we, you know, the, the desire and the burning you know, that we had to do it for being a servant of God, that it gets pushed to the back, and all of a sudden it just becomes a thing that we have to do. You know what I mean? Well, you get comfortable in it. Mm, and you get numb to it, too. Yes. That's the other thing that I think as Christians we have to be very careful about. My prayer is, is that we have a desperation for him and a love like and I don't want to name call or names, but Judy Kennedy, I said it. <laughs> she has that passion, you know, for God that it just, I'm envious about that at times. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've ever heard her speak, you know what I'm talking about. I love her passion that she has, and I think, Lord, I, I want that passion. Well, I can have that passion too. It's, it's me pressing in and trying to reach, you know, reach for the hem of his garment. Mm -hmm. And how many times have I actually face planted in trying to do that? You know what I'm saying? That's mm -hmm. where I think that, because we're always, like you said, we're too busy or, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. People think I'm crazy. Well, so what? So what? That woman, mm -hmm. like you said, she didn't care. She was beyond caring what anybody thought. Have you ever yearned for God as the body scorched with heat and exhaustion, screams for water? Have you felt the need to search for God and to experience him, just him, more of him, especially in the midst of a great trial and need? God is pleased with this kind of yearning. In fact, he desires it. Acts 17 says that God's workings are so that they, man, shall seek God and perhaps feel, feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. That's, I mean, to me, that's a promise. He's not far from each one of us. Long for him today and experience him, and, it, and he will respond in a wonderful and satisfying way. I think that we think about that and it's just words. We don't understand what satisfying means. And um, But anyway, I'm not going to go into that part of it. And Matthew 7 says that he who seeks will find that which he seeks for. So um, anyway, I, um, I really, like I said, I got a lot out of the two stories that I was mm -hmm. doing. And I mean, we can go on and on. I mean, I can go on. You know, one of my other favorite stories is about Peter. I yes. can't help it. I love that story. Um, I think about his desperation when he looked at the waves and he began to sink. I think about that because I feel like that's me. In so many, in my life, I've looked away. I've looked at my situation. I felt myself sinking. And But, you know, the Bible says immediately, immediately he reaches down and grabs him. Immediately. And I'm like, that's how he does us. All you got to do is cry out. That's all you, all you got to do. Cry do. out because he hears you. Yeah. And I think about him. I always put myself in Peter's place. I think that's why I love that story is because he saw him on the water and he's like, let me come to you. And he says, come, come to me, you know, and you're looking at him and you know while you're looking right at him, you know, you're in his presence at that moment. Everything's going to be okay. But as soon as something starts coming and hitting you, whether it's a virus, you know, something like that, you're 
eyes go completely off of him and it's on that situation. It's like, okay, I've got to do this and now I can't do this and I can't do that. This is happening. And all of a sudden they become so huge mm -hmm. that you can't see Jesus across that mountain because he's on the other side of it, standing in that water. But yet this mountain just come out of nowhere. And that's me. I've done that over and over. And um, so whenever I, that's why I love that story because I think about, that's me. That's me exactly. So, mm -hmm. um, is there anything else to add? Um, no, I was just thinking, you know, about our services, like in church. That's how it is when the Spirit is moving in the, in the church service and the Holy Spirit falls. You don't have, you have no concept of time. You have no concept of what's going on around you. You're just in his presence. And you don't, you're not concerned or worried about all the stuff that's going on around you. And that's what came to mind when you said when we're focused on him instead of what's mm -hmm. going on around us in the storm. It's just like I've been in services where the spirit moves and you, you lose all concept of time. Mm -hmm. And by the time the service is over, you're like, Wow, I didn't realize what time it was. Mm -hmm. You know, just because you're in the presence, in His presence. Mm -hmm. I think that um, we we're so comfortable getting out of His presence, though, because we know life, and we've got this, and we've got that. And so, when all of that's taken away, mm -hmm. you can't just get in. This, you can't just run to the store anymore because it's just not so easy anymore. You can't go down here. You can't go shopping. You can't do that. And so, you can't go to church. <clears throat> and so, you have to find. I know that people uh, I've talked to have been studying and reading more, and and, um, and you know I've asked, well, what what have you been studying? And you know, share with me. And, and I've gotten so many um, texts about devotions they've been reading. I'm like, man, some of these are really good. So I've been reading and sharing, and I love that that we are sharing mm -hmm. that we've never done this before. You know, we've never done some things like this. So I think this has been an opportunity yes. to get to know some of your church people. Mm -hmm. It's all fine and good to be here together. I love that we're here together. Meet and greet's great. We hug each other's neck. We go on and blah, blah, blah. But we don't have connection sometimes. And this has been a way to connect with people. I think this is what God wanted. Out of this mess, he's, he's turned things around for a lot of us. And I think for most of us. And I'm not saying this hasn't been bad because there's people that's dead, that died, that's sick, um, that are at risk. I know that. I know that. And this is serious. And I don't take it lightly either. But I know that... Um, during there has to be something good come out of this because that's that's who god is I mean, if nothing else i know his character mm -hmm. so he's going to make something like i said the testimonies when this is all said and done are going to be amazing so um, as we close today um i think that scripture shows us the good things that we should pursue and immerse ourselves in from scriptures we find wisdom to thrive in this life and enjoy it from scriptures we find out how to delight ourselves in god we learn what pleases him and we learn what brings lasting treasure and pleasure in our very lives. Um, I'll say it again. Where you stare is where you steer. And I pray that you are staring and going to the scriptures and to God because that's what he wants. That's what he's been calling us to do for a very long time. I think this has been an eye-opening experience for all of us. I think each and every one of us have gotten something different. And that's all good because that's what we're supposed to because none of us are exactly the same anyway. I know that God has been present in so many of our lives um, like never before. I feel like that uh, intimate relationship is something that we do not pursue. We do not have desperation for him on that kind of level. And I pray that you guys get something out of this. Me and Becky, um, this was just a conversation, really. Uh, and it was a good conversation. Yeah. I pray that you guys have a wonderful night. And we love y'all. Cannot wait to see you. I'm going to pray before we go. And uh, hope to see you guys soon. We love y'all. Dear Heavenly Father, God, first I just thank you, Lord. I just want to praise your name and thank you for the opportunity that you give us to be here tonight, Lord, to lift your name up, God. Lord, I pray for desperation in our churches and our families. I pray that our hearts are changed and turned to you, God. I don't know what's going on or what's going to happen with this, but I do know that you're in control of it, and we're not. And, Lord, I pray for the ones that are in need tonight, the ones that are facing sickness or ill, God. I pray, God, that they will see you in every situation, Lord. I know that 
the illnesses that we have are serious, God, and I know that. And I pray right now over those families. I pray for healing. I pray for miraculous healing because you are the healer. You're the great physician, Lord. And I pray for those families to find some comfort tonight, Lord. And God, for this church and the, the members that we have, I pray for each and every one of them. I love them so much, Lord, and I pray that you will meet their needs. And I thank you for the staff that we have here, Lord. I pray for our deacons and Mary and Joseph. I pray, God, that you'll guard and protect their hearts, Lord. I pray that you will be their strength. Lord, I pray for their um, for their families. I pray, God, that you'll put a hedge of protection around each and every one of them. I thank you for their, their heart, for our worship team, Lord, for each and every one of them. I love them, and I thank you for what they're doing for us online. Every week, God, they come and they do, and they just bless us, Lord, with your words, and I thank you for that. And, God, thank you for just the opportunity that we have here tonight, Lord, to come before this video, Lord, just to, just to put something out there, God, that you have put on our hearts, Lord. I pray that it touches someone's heart tonight, Lord, and I just pray, God, for each and every person listening tonight that you will touch them. Lord, we're just going to be careful to give you all the praise, and we love you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.